Hello, welcome to Parallel Track 10. And this is the track where we hear the remainder of the proteins proceedings. I'm Mark Wass from the University of Kent in the UK, and I'll be chairing this session. So we're gonna quickly move on to the talks. Our first talk is uh, by Sabrina Deavazzo Silvera, and she's going to talk to us about GRASP, a graph-based residue neighborhood strategy to predict binding sites. Over to you, Sabrina. Okay, thanks, Mark. Can you see the presentation? Yes. Okay, thanks. Hello, everyone. My name is Sabrina Silveira. I'm going to present GRASP, which is a machine learning strategy to predict binding sites. Thank you for finding the time to join me today for this presentation. This work was developed during my year-long visit to Thornton Group at Amble EBI. I would like to divide this talk into parts. So first of all, I will talk about how we model the problem of predicting binding sites. And in the second part, I'll show some GRASP results. I would like to start by defining what GRASP is. So it is a machine learning strategy that represents a particular residue and its neighbors as a graph at the atomic level in order to perceive some residue environment information. So for each residue from the protein structure, some topological and physical chemical properties of its atoms and interactions are represented as a graph. And this graph is encoded as a feature vector for the next step, which is a machine learning strategy. So considering a residue from a protein structure, the non-covalent interactions established by this residue and its two first shells of residues are calculated based on some physical chemical properties of atoms and distance criteria. So we represent the residue itself and also re represent the neighborhood, the structural neighborhood of this residue. So the next step is to encode this graph as a feature vector. So here we have a fragment of a matrix that serves as input for our, our classifier. To illustrate what this matrix represents, we have here uh, highlighted in red two cells, which means that the, we have a residue that is uh, proline number three in chain A from PWID 1A59. And in this cell highlighted in red with number one, uh, we have, we, it means that this residue establishes one hydrogen bond. In the last column, we have the class information, which is zero if the residue is no, it's not part of the binding site, and we have one otherwise. So this is the kind of data that serve as, serves as input for our classifier. So the, that's all I have to say about how we model the, the prediction of binding sites. Now we will move on to results. So to show grasp generality and applicability in real world scenario, we conducted a comprehensive set of experiments. So GRASP was compared with residue-centric methods, which are the, the methods of the same type of GRASP. So this kind of method, considering a residue, they predict if this residue is binding site or not. GRASP was also compared with pocket-centric methods. And in addition, we used GRASP to predict binding sites for multiple chain protein structures and also for um, protein structures in the bound and in the unbound state. So in this first experiment, GRASP was compared with six other residue-centric methods using a, a benchmark data set of 500 non-redundant single-chain proteins. These kind of methods, they use MCC, which is method correlation coefficient to evaluate predictors. And here we see that GRASP ranks first. For completeness, we also present precision and recall. The point of this experiment is to show that GRASP is able to calculate predictions that are comparable or superior to other residue-centric methods. 
Also, there are some modern methods that they are pocket centric, they are popular and they present good results. So a natural question that arises is how GRASP compares with these kind of methods. To perform this comparison, we had to adapt our results because we predict residues that are binding site and not pockets. So we use a clustering algorithm to group together points in areas of high density, separated by areas of low density. So to illustrate this strategy, we have here some residues in orange. They were considered as a binding site because they are in an area of high density and the same happens to the residues in magenta. But these two residues in cyan, they were disregarded in this comparison. Here we have the results. We used two data sets. So all of 4K is a large data set of multiple chain, multiple chain protein structures and coach is a data set of single chain protein structures. And some previous works in the literature, they consider that a predicted site is correct if its center is no farther than four angstroms to any atom of the ligand. But to avoid arbitrary thresholds, we considered a range of cutoffs, so from 1 to 20 angstroms. Um, from four angstroms onwards, we see that GRASP ranks second here in blue in two data sets. So it seems that um, this is in accordance with the cutoff that we found in the literature. And we believe this result is significant because GRASP was not devised to calculate pockets that can be potential binding sites. In this third experiment, we have the bound and unbound data sets. Um, more specifically, we have same structures, but in bound and unbound state. And GRASP was able to deal with both states. So we have here as an example the human thrombin and bound the state with the ligand in green. The binding site is in magenta. Structures are slightly different, but we see that measures are quite high. We have MCC 0.75 and 0.76 for bound and unbound proteins. We believe this experiment is relevant because some proteins in the unbound state they do not present and surface pockets with appropriate size for ligand binding. So it seems to be, in a general manner, more challenging to predict binding sites for unbound proteins. So that's why we believe this, this experiment is important because it illustrates that GRASP is able to do with both of them. On the top, on the right hand side, we have measures for the whole data set. The values of measures are similar for bound and unbound states. And in this last experiment, GRASP was used to predict binding sites for all of 4K data set, which contains about 4,500 multiple chain structures. To illustrate this experiment, we have here HIV-1 protease. We see that this protein contains two chains and the binding site was predicted. It's here on magenta. And this binding site involves residues from both chains. Uh, we see measures here for this specific experiment, MCC 0.88. On the top, on the right hand side, we see values of measures for the whole data set. And we believe this experiment is relevant because it, it illustrates that GRASP can deal with both multiple chain and single chain structures. And more specifically, GRASP is able to predict binding sites that involves residues from multiple chains. Um, the, the state-of-the-art residue-centric method is not able to do this. It just handles single-chain protein structures. So to sum up, we propose in this work a machine learning strategy which we named as GRASP. It's residue-centric. It's based on residue neighborhood graphs to predict binding sites. It's important to mention that our method is not based on sequence alignment and it's not based on structural superimposition. Um, it's important to point out that GRASP does not work as a black box, which means that we understand what comes in, the descriptors are meaningful, they are interpretable, and they can be explored to help us to make sense of the predictions. Also, GRASP makes compatible superior predictions when compared to residue-centric methods and also when compared to 
pocket-centric method. And last but not least, GRASP takes 10 to 20 seconds on average to predict a binding site for protein structure, while competitors, the state-of-the-art competitor, which is residue-centric, takes two to five hours to do the same task. That's why we say that our method is scalable. I have to thank our authors, especially Dr. Janet Thornton for hosting me in her group. Thank you everyone for your attention. If you have any questions, I would be happy to answer. Thank you, Sabrina. That's great. So let's see the questions. I can just find them. So, okay, we have a question. Uh, for what, uh, could you give us some more detail on what you use the graphs for? Yes, we use the graphs with LinkedIn to represent the neighborhood, the structural neighborhood of a residue. But then we had to kind of summarize this graph in a kind of uh, feature vector. Right, okay, thank you. Um, if you do have questions, please uh, uh, go ahead and type them in. We'll go ahead and ask them. So um, while we wait for some to come in, I'm going to ask you, um, you mentioned that it's not a black box, the method that you've developed. So um, have you identified what features are the most important? Yes, the one, uh, the, especially the ones connected with surface. The ones that represent if the residue is in the surface or not. This one, we have three uh, descriptors connected to surface and they are quite high when we rank them. Okay, and I guess then it must be a combination of other things because you're clearly not predicting just the whole surface. Yes, yes, it's a combination of things, but the first ones are connected to surf surface. Um, so we have another question. Did you use any kind of weights for the residues? If yes, what, what criteria did you use? Not exactly weights, but um, when we summarize the shells, we sum the properties and we average them by the number of residues in the shell, but it's not exactly weight. Okay, right. So um, at that point, we don't have any more questions. I'm going to thank you very much, Sabrina, mm -hmm. for that uh, really interesting talk. And we'll move on to the next presentation. So our next presentation is by Lucas Kurgan from the Virginia Commonwealth University in the United States. And he is going to talk to us about his method, Prob Select, Accurate Prediction of Protein Binding Residues from Protein Sequences via Dynamic Predictor Selection. So I'll pass over to you, Lucas. Uh, thank you, Mark. Uh, just a sound check, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, awesome. So uh, welcome to my talk and welcome to my office in a COVID um, um, environment here in the United States. Um, we'll be discussing our latest tool, Prop Select, uh, for the prediction of protein binding residues. Uh, I would like to highlight that this is a work in collaboration with Min Lee's group at the Central South University and also with uh, my former student and now a young assistant professor, Dr. Jian Zhang. And uh, the majority of the actual work was done by the first author, Fu Ha Zhang. So with that, uh, let's get started. Um, we work here with methods that make predictions of protein binding directly from the protein sequences. And the key thing here to recognize is that these methods work on sequences. They're dissimilar to already annotated proteins. So these methods are more robust than alignments that will require high levels of similarity to be accurate. Uh, so predictions, uh, and an example here is provided by this uh, SSWRF method, include two pieces, a numeric propensity for protein binding, which is shown using the green line, and the derived binary classification for each amino acid, which is typically based on thresholding the properties. So we have this thresholding line here, and residues above that line are annotated as binding, which are denoted here at the top, using these uh, horizontal bars. Essentially, residues, the propensities higher than the threshold are predicted as protein binding. So this is how a prediction would look like. So the question is, why do we need these methods? Uh, there, there are many reasons, uh, the main being to support 
functional characterization of proteins done at the amino acid level. They, these methods provide uh, missing details for the popular PPI networks. A significant majority of interactions in those PPI networks uh, lack any structural details. Essentially, they say that two proteins interact. Uh, the predictions like this provide useful constraints for uh, the protein-protein docking, uh, which, will est uh, which will build 3D models of the protein-protein interactions, will help to estimate binding affinities for a pair of interacting proteins. And they were successfully used in several different applications, including uh, identification of driving mutations in a context of personalized medicine applications. So uh, we started this project by analyzing state of the art in this field. Uh, we empirically assessed current methods, focusing on methods that are available, that are scalable, uh, predictions take under 30 minutes, and those that produce both the propensity and the binary predictions. Um, we are first to actually assess protein level results. Uh, what that means is that allows us to investigate stability of these predictions across different proteins. Um, besides the commonly done, the data set level assessment. Uh, finally, we created a new benchmark data set. Uh, this benchmark data set uh, shares low similarity with training sets of included methods below the actual uh, level where the alignment could produce reasonable results. Uh, this data set also allows us to quantify the so-called cross predictions which are defined as incorrect predictions of protein binding among residues that in fact bind other ligands. Uh, this is where potential weakness of the current methods lies. Uh, correspondingly, our data set is a mixture of protein that binds proteins and proteins that interact other ligands, including nucleic acids and uh, small ligands. We cover all together, we've covered all together nine methods uh, with the newest being released just this year and the oldest being released in 2007. So it's a good mixture of different methods. Um, so the first, let's report uh, the median per protein values on our benchmark data set. So what we see here is relatively modest predictive quality with the best methods being in a range of about 0.7 AUC. A star here denotes statistical significance So the top two methods are statistically identical, the other methods are statistically worse. Um, we also measured uh, the rate of correct predictions among native protein binding residues, which is sensitivity, to the uh, rate of incorrect predictions of protein binding among uh, other residues, which is a false positive rate. A rate above one is a good thing, and what we can see here is majority of the methods have decent rates of sensitivity to FPR. We also repeated that measurement of sensitivity, but we divided by the rate of incorrect predictions among those residues that bind other ligands. And here the situation is a little bit different. What you can see here, rates are only about one to 1.5, one being really equivalent to a random predictor. In that case, you predict as many protein binding residues among non uh, other binding ligands as among protein binding ligands. The one exception here is the scriber that has relatively good rates. And this is because this method was specifically designed to separate uh, protein binding residues from residues that bind other ligands. But this comes as an expense of uh, lower overall predictive performance. So the bottom line here is we see two problems, modest predictive quality, and we also see problems with cross predictions right here. <clears throat> Now, uh, to give you more detail, uh, here are the actual distributions of the per protein quality uh, in those violin plots. So if you look at the best method right here, overall, you see a broad range of quality per protein from really quite bad here at 0.5 or below AUC to really quite good around 0.9. This means that users are really not safe from getting a poor result if they choose to rely on a single method. So a single method might give you a great prediction or really bad prediction. Uh, here's another view. The scatter plot organizes the result by the AUC of the most accurate overall CRFPPI method. That's the black line from the worst to the best predictions. Uh, we again see that 
other tools outperform this method across the entire spectrum of the results. So uh, predictive quality of other methods could be above or below this best method. This means that there's no single best method in this field. And to a certain degree, these methods are complementary to each other. <clears throat> so this brings me to uh, this uh, set of two quote unquote simple rhetorical questions. Having in mind what I just discussed, uh, which of uh, these three color coded predictions would you use for these proteins of interest? Um, also, would you trust any of them? And uh, these are the sort of the implicit questions that the end users of these tools have to struggle with. And uh, this brings me to the main topic of this talk, a new tool that aims to solve these problems, these problems of being able to understand the quality of the prediction that you see in front of you. We essentially aim to select the best predictor for a given protein by predicting and comparing performance of different methods on that protein. So we've built a tool and the main benefits of our tools are, number one, improvement in performance if we can consistently select accurate predictors. And number two, providing the anticipated predictive performance which we quantify with AUC, uh, which would inform user whether he or she should trust the selected prediction. And both of these benefits come even before you run the actual predictor. So we are going to make these predictions of predictions ahead of time. Uh, so this brings me to the architecture for our solution. Um, this is essentially a three-step process. In the first step right here at the top, we generate a, a physiochemical profile from the input protein chain. This profile estimates a, a host of relevant information, including secondary structure, uh, uh, disorder, uh, conservation, solvent accessibility, and some pro amino acid propensities for interactions. Uh, then uh, we feed this profile into a support vector regression uh, model to predict AUC of selected methods. And then we combine these predictions to select the best option at the bottom. So that's step two and that's step three. Um, and sadly, I, I'm limited on time, so I can't tell you more about the architecture, but all of the details can be found in the article. So I'll move on to results. Uh, the results are in the table and they show you that we can reasonably well predict the perf predictive performance. So the uh, correlations are in a range of about 0.4, which is reasonable, and the error rates are modest. They are not great, they're modest. Uh, and if we compare with the only alternative, which is alignment, they are much better. Uh, mind you, this is the first tool for the job, so the only thing that we can compare with is an alignment-based prediction. So, uh, but that's not the point. The point here is to see whether these predictions of predictive performance could uh, provide what we ask, which is whether they can be used for their original purpose to improve the predictions of protein binding and to estimate the predictive performance. So this bar chart shows you that uh, the tool that we've built, the prop select, uh, produces higher as AUC than uh, the best of the current tools. So these are the two best current tools. Uh, their AUC is right here. Uh, so we get this kind of a margin of improvement by this uh, classifier selection uh, setup. Now, uh, when you look at the rate of sensitivity to FCPR, which is inversely proportional to cross predictions, uh, the improvements are even bigger. The best methods are here, our result is here, and this is the rate of improvement, essentially, right here. We've also compared to a more classical, traditional consensus, where you would essentially combine multiple methods together. And uh, again, we show a reasonable improvement in AUC, and then a big jump in uh, the uh, rate of cross-prediction. So our approach can improve on both aspects. Now, you, have two, uh, you have two minutes left, Lucas. Sure. Uh, we have a server which is available at the link listed at the top. Uh, you need to simply enter a protein sequence, uh, hit run, and you are going to get a suggestion of which method to use, an estimate of the predictive performance, and a link where to go to collect the prediction. Uh, so I'll go back to where we started, the example protein that we've looked at. So. Um, if you would use our server, you will learn which tool to use and whether to trust its prediction. So if we would enter this sequence, 
uh, prop select will give you this output, will say this method is the best, this is the corresponding AUC, and that's the best selection in fact. And you can compare the results. This protein is actually an enzyme that forms a dimer. So this is the interface. The interface residues are listed here on the sequence with the gr uh, green highlights. And you can see that the two green, the green prediction lines up very well with that, uh, uh, with that interface set of residues. So uh, to conclude, um, um, we show that the current tools offer modest predictive performance uh, that varies between proteins and which is strongly affected by the issue of the cross predictions. We show that it's possible to predict the predictive quality directly from the sequence. And these predictions are used to implement this new tool called PropSelect. And this is a novel approach that produces improved predictions based on the so-called classifier selection, dynamic classifier selection, uh, which is different than the typically used consensus computation. Uh, we show some encouraging results, and we do provide a web server for your convenience. And uh, with that, I guess I'm running out of time, so I'll stop here, and I'm open to take some questions. Thank you. Thank you, Lucas. That was a, a very interesting talk. So please, uh, if you have questions, uh, please get writing them now. I'm going to start with a question. So um, I think early on I was thinking, oh, why don't you just try a consensus? And then you've actually obviously compared to consensus at the end. So what, why do you think that your method outperforms just taking a general consensus? Well, I guess the, the answer to the question comes from the scatter plot. It's hard to build something that kind of works on average if you have such a huge uh, diversity of results for individual proteins. So if, if you look at one individual protein, it's like looking at a vertical line, you have a really broad diversity of results. So if you try to sort of average them through a consensus, you are typically going to go below or just slightly over the best of what's available. If you instead try to pick the best result, as long as you can do it reasonably well, the results are going to get better. Simple as that. Okay, so we have a question. Uh, how scalable is the method? Can it be applied to whole genomes, metagenomes? Um, so um, part of the methodology, um, let me uh, scroll to uh, that slide if I can. Part of the methodology, unfortunately, is uh, the calculation of, um, of, of a specific predictor called Scriber. So this takes about two to three minutes per protein. Uh, the rest is just running to regression. So I would say uh, roughly two to three minutes per protein. At this point, our server has a limit to five proteins at, an, at a single run. So we do allow for batch predictions, but on a smaller scale. So if you want to do the whole genome, uh, it's not impossible, but it's going to be rather challenging. Uh, we can do probably hundreds of proteins, but not thousands of proteins. Okay. Um, and one quick last question. How large a training set would you need to adapt your method for another ligand such as RNA? Uh, it's a good question. Uh, and we are working on solutions for, uh, for RNA and DNA binding. Uh, the data set is, doesn't need to be large. The, the training set that we've used here was about two to 300 uh, proteins. So it's definitely doable. The training set that we used is based on essentially uh, PDB data. There's enough data to build tools like that for RNA and DNA, yes. Okay, so maybe we can have one last question while we switch over. If the next speaker wants to get there, start sharing their screen. Um, so we've had a question. If you understand your talk correctly, a predictor is a possible solution. The other will be to classify the proteins in classes that are adequate for different methods. The two approaches can be connected. Um, so it's kind of uh, pre-selecting uh, clusters of uh, proteins for a predictor, uh, if I understand right. Um, so I, I guess it's a, it's a possibility in a sense that instead of uh, uh, 
um, finding the best predictor for each protein individual. Okay. And we would group proteins I, into clusters that would be specific to specific methods. It's an interesting suggestion. Okay. I'll, 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 I'll put some thought into that. Yes. Thank you. I think we ought to now move on to the next speaker. Thank you very much, Lucas. So next up, we have Yishu Peng from Northeastern University in the US. And they're going to talk to us about new mixture models for decoy-free force discovery rate estimation in mass spectrometry proteomics. So all over to you, Yishu. Hey, thank you, Mac, for the introduction. Uh, my name is Yishu Peng from Northeastern University. Uh, today I'm going to talk about our work on new mixture models uh, for decoy-free FDR estimation in uh, mass spectrometry, spectrometry proteomics. Uh, so mass spectrometry is a key technique in today's uh, proteomics and protein identification task. First, uh, proteins are dissembled into segment ions of separate peptides, which is then being analyzed with mass spectrometer to get the spectrum. Then the spectrum is fed into a search engine to, uh, to find the matching peptide from a hypothesis sequence database. This search step may result in a substantial proportion of errors, which will be cascaded into the later protein inference step and result in an even higher error rate. So controlling the error rate in the search step is necessary because we, uh, we don't know what are the truths. So uh, people are using FDR, uh, the false discovery rate to control the error rate. And nowadays, the most popular approach is the target coil approach, uh, which is proposed by Gigi in 2007. It is a semi-supervised approach in which a decoy database is built to mimic the distribution of incorrect meshing. Uh, the pro pros of this method is that it is very straightforward and uh, easy to use. Uh, however, uh, it doubles the searching time. Sometimes it won't, uh, won't be affordable for huge databases. For example, in a cross-linked pipeline uh, research, the size of the database is, uh, is squared, and it will be a big problem to, to double it. And sometimes it's not easy to con construct a decoy database. Uh, for example, in small molecule mass spectrometry, this, the structure is not in a linear chain, but rather uh, contain complex structures. So it's uh, it's going to be a really a complex task to construct a decoy database. For these reasons, we turn our eyes to another approach, the decoy-free approach. But, uh, adopted by Habitat Profit, uh, is pro proposed by Keller in 2002. Uh, the Habitat Profit uses gum and Doshi mixture models to analyze the scores and uh, estimate FDR. And here is our approach. So uh, we hypothesize that uh, the scores are mixtures of uh, two uh, of two distributions. The scores for the correct matches and the incorrect matches. Uh, both are modeled by a skew normal distribution which is uh, different to, uh, from uh, the previous peptide profit uh, method. So we also incorporated the uh, second A scores to assist the estimation. So we consider the second score as a mixture of three components. The correct one as uh, in the top case and uh, another uh, incorrect distribution and the uh, part uh, correct that's lower than the top incorrect. 
we derived an ERM algorithm to estimate the parameters. Then we estimate FDR over threshold using the CDFs. Uh, when the first one is correct, and the second score should come from the same distribution when the first one is incorrect. Well, the first one is incorrect. There are two possibilities. Either it could, uh, it also is uh, incorrect and comes from another incorrect uh, distribution, or it could be correct and comes from the same distribution when the first score is correct. And here is uh, our result. Uh, this is an example this set we take from Pride, which has about 50,000 spectra. The first figure is Gamma Gaussian model, and we can see there is some uh, offset between the estimated distribution and the score histogram. On the right, it is the model of skew number mixture on the uh, top score. And we can see that this model fits the data better. On the bottom, uh, our model both, uh, we model both top hit and uh, second hit scores. Here we don't see big benefits uh, using the second score in the model, but later we will see the difference. Uh, we then compare the quality of the estimate FDR. We extract the spectra from this library where each spectrum has an associated peptide, which can be considered as the ground truth. We compare the matched, uh, matched peptide against the peptide from this database, and then we plot the estimated FDR with the frequency of mismatches against the nested feedback. Uh, we use four species from NIST and again the 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 68 percent confidence interval showing in bands uh, or is a uh, one standard error uh, range. So the ideal estimation is on the identical line. Uh, above the line means we are underestimating the uh, FDR, while under, under the line is more conservative, overestimating the FDR. We can see that the estimation with two samples method is better than uh, both the gamma Gauchy model and uh, one, one sample mo mixture model. And here we run the algorithm on HeLa cell experiments data, which is uh, obtained by Alexander Group. The experiments are taking different concentrations of the same com components and uh, generating spectra. Here we are showing results of low, lowest concentration experiment so that uh, we can see the uh, uh, the most difference. Uh, here, the abundance of material is very low in this example, so it's hardly to see the distribution of the correct matches. So that the Gamagoshi mix model fi fails to fit the data well, both uh, but both of our models with one sample or Two samples fit the data very well, and we can we can see from the thresholds. Okay, and uh, then we did bootstrapping experiments on the hello cell experiments. We uh, we are box plotting the estimated one percent FDR threshold, and we can see that. Uh, the two samples mixture model has made the thresholds uh, the best uh, among these uh, models. And the thresholds, it's actually very stable and it keeps around 18. 
And in summary, um, so error rate control is essential in protein identification. And this is also true for S FDR estimation, which can be done in two major approaches, the target decoy approach and the decoy free approach. Although the decoy approach is straightforward and easy to use, there are many limitations. We found in our study that the skill norm uh, mixture model works great in FDR estimation and using second hit scores can improve both the performance and the stability. And in the end, I have to thank all the authors in our, uh, in our team and especially thanks to Shandu for uh, key contributions. Thank you. Um, Great, thank you very much. I'd be happy to take any uh, question. Great, thank you very much, Yishu. Thanks. So um, if you have questions, please uh, start writing them now and I will uh, get them across to Yishu. So I guess I'll start with a question. What do you yeah. think is the main reason that your method provides an improvement? So, uh, so as opposed to the previous uh, Gamagoshi model. Uh, so, which for the in which method the uh, correct distribution is modeled with the Gaussian model, which have uh, needs have the mode in the center of the distribution. But we can see that uh, in a lot of data set, the uh, the the discord distributions mode is uh, shifted to the left so that the uh, Gaussian model will fit the data a little worse and uh, result in the threshold to be a little misestimated. Uh, and however, in our uh, approach, the skew, skew normal model distribution will uh, fit data better and uh, more correctly uh, find the threshold. Okay, thank you. thank you very much. So we don't have any other questions. So I'm going to thank you again, Yishu, and we'll uh, move on to the final talk in the session. So our final talk is by Zhenling Peng from Tianjin University in China. And she is going to talk to us about a method called APOD, Accurate Sequence-Based Predictor of Disorder flexible linkers. So I'll pass over to you, Jinling. Oh, thank you for your uh, introduction. Hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Jinling from Tianjin University. It's my honor to present our work apart uh, the accurate uh, prediction of disorder flexible linkers from protein sequence, uh, sequence here. The disorder flexible linkers are a functional model of intrinsically disordered protein. So let's look at what is intrinsically disordered protein at first. The Epsilon rule tells us the protein sequence determines the structure of this protein and this structure will determine the function of this pro protein. Uh, 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 example, if we have the sequence of the enzyme 3TVO, then this sequence will fold into a fixed structure in cell. And this structure will determine that this protein will uh, participate the catalytic activity. Another example, if we have the sequence of the modifier 1A5R, then this uh, sequence will present a dynamic structure in cell. And this structure will allow this protein to participate a variety of functions Inclu uh, including post-translation and modification, the interaction with other proteins, RNA, a transcription factor, etc. Uh, actually, in nature, there are lots of these kinds of proteins which uh, lack stable 3D structure, or we can say which uh, show dynamic structure in viva, but still perform biologic functions in cells. Those kinds of proteins are intrinsically disordered pr protein. So the example modifier 1A5R is an LP. In this example, we can observe that the N terminal and the C terminal in this uh, um, structure in, in this 
uh, protein are extremely flexible or disordered in structure. So uh, those regions, we call them as intrinsically disordered region. In general, an IDP uh, comprises at least one IDR. Previous studies have found that uh, IDPs are common in nature and functionally important in cells. Based on the DISPROD database, the discovered uh, ID, uh, functions of IDPs can be grouped into seven um, types. Each type of function can be further divided uh, into sub-functions. In our work, we care about the IDRs, which serve as flexible linkers. We call those IDRs as disordered flexible linkers. Recent studies have shown that DFLs are important in functions. Um, for, for example, the facilitate and regulate the inter and intradomain movement, the participate in peptide aggregation, allosteric regulation, and so on. They are also found to be abundant in human proteome. So there are hundreds of uh, DFL proteins, but based on the current re re release of this product database, there are only 126 proteins uh, which are curated with DFL annotations. So there is a big gap in DFL annotations. Uh, it is meaningful to develop the computational methods for the prediction of DFLs from protein sequence. But uh, to the best of our knowledge, we only find one DFL predictor, that is DFL PRED. This method is very fast, but uh, um, uh, but uh, it can predict uh, DFL regions in the sequence in seconds. But this method uh, ignored some time, some time consuming but powerful DFL indicators, including the sequence conservation. So uh, we are motivated to perform accurate prediction on DFLs in protein sequence. To solve this problem, we uh, collected uh, the proteins from the database, uh, DISPRO database of the re release at point zero, which comprises um, nearly 6,000 DFL residues and uh, nearly 30,000 non DFL residues. So our collected data sets are, is unbalanced. We then remove the sequence redundancy. In the final, we uh, divided, divided the non redundant data set into the training and test data set respectively. Using the training data set, we uh, designed the upper model by following the architecture presented in this figure. Uh, specifically, the upper model takes the sequence as the input, then each amino acid in this sequence is represented by a 170 dimensional numerical vector. This vector was, is then input into the support vector machine algorithm. In the final, this model will output the both binary and propensity score for each residue in this input sequence. In sequence representation, we uh, considered both window-based features and the sequence level feature as well. In window-based features, we use a sliding window to extract amino acid composition, the sequence conservation, the uh, secondary and relevant solvent, relative solvent accessibility related features and the disorder related features to represent the center residue in this sliding window. In sequence level feature, we only consider the, the disorder content, which is the fraction of disorder residues in a given sequence. As, uh, as I just mentioned, we considered both window-based features and the sequence level feature. So we investigated the predictive performance of each uh, single feature group. The results are summarized in this figure. From this figure, we can observe that among all four types of uh, window-based features, the sequence conservation is the most powerful indicator for DFL residues because the SVM model built by, the, built by this con sequence conservation feature group uh, can achieve the highest AUC and MCC um, among all five S, uh, four SVM models, which implemented by using a single window-based feature group. And all four uh, window-based feature groups 
um, is more powerful than the sequence level feature disorder content for the FL prediction. This can be explained by the fact that the sequence level feature disorder content uh, um, is uh, is the same for all residues in in the given sequence. So this uh, feature alone cannot distinguish the DFL regions from non-DFL regions in the protein sequence. But interestingly, when we combine the sequence uh, level feature disorder content with the window-based disorder-related features together, then the corresponding SVM model will improve the AUC by uh, at least 0.13 uh, and MCC is at least, is nearly three times higher. So this means that the integration of the sequence level fe disorder feature and the window-based disorder feature are meaningful for DFL predictions. When we combine all uh, five types of considered features to implement the upward mode, we can observe that the upward achieves 0.81 AUC and 0.3 at MCC. This is obviously higher than using a single feature group. This means that uh, all five considered feature groups can reflect different properties of the DFL regions. To investigate the um, predictive performance of the upward model. We compared our upward model with the existing predicted DFL thread. The results are summarized in these two figures. In the left figure, we can observe that our upward model outperforms the DFL thread method uh, with a large margin, no matter in AUC, MCC precision or recall. The ROC curve also support that our upward model outperforms the DFL thread method. Oh, uh, actually, we also um, compelled uh, our method with several indirect approaches. Uh, the results also show that our method apart uh, is statistically outperform uh, better than <laughs> better than all considered indirect approaches. Based on our analysis and the experimental evaluation, we conclude that our RPAD mode outperforms the existing DFL predictors in DFL prediction. And uh, we think the success of the RPAD mode method can be attributed to the inclusion of powerful indicator for DFLs, such as sequence conservation. The introducing of the sequence feature disorder content, especially the integration of the sequence level disorder information with the window-based disorder information. Uh, thirdly, um, uh, the all five considered fe feature group uh, reflect the, uh, I mean, uh, they are different from each other. So the integration of these five uh, feature group uh, can improve the prediction in the DFL prediction further. We also implement a web server for our method. When you submit a sequence um, in fast format here and uh, click the submit button, our method will pro, uh, our web server will, uh, um, pro, will present the DFL predictions in minutes later. Um, thank, thank all the authors to, um, for, for our work and the fundings to support our work. That's all, thank you. Great, thank you very much, uh, Zhen Ling, for that very interesting talk. Um, so if you have questions, please get writing them now and I will put them to Zhen Ling. Um, while we're waiting, I, I have a question for you. So um, I typically think of disordered regions as often not being that well conserved. Um, you see that con sequence conservation was the most informative feature. So, why do you think that that was? Uh, this this is based on the uh, uh, analysis here, uh, because the sequence conservation when when you when we only use this uh, type of features to. Uh, to build the SVM model uh, for the DFL prediction, 
the corresponding model can achieve the highest uh, AUC and MCC. So we think this uh, is the most powerful indicator among all wind-based uh, features. And uh, actually, we also find, find uh, uh, we also um, uh, measured the correlation between all considered features uh, to the uh, DFL regions. Uh, the correlation is measured by the absolute point by the correlation. Then um, the correlation here, we can see that uh, compared to the other three types of uh, window-based features, this group of features show uh, more show better correlation to the DFL regions. So we think, yeah, okay. that's our analysis. So if I if I understand correctly your classifiers are classifying between just, just disordered residues and disordered flexible linkers. Yeah, yeah. And so yeah, yes. is, is the finding then that the flexible linkers are much more highly conserved than generally disordered residues? Is that the, the, the uh, message from that? Based on the point by correlation, the I think they are. Okay, yeah. great. Right, uh, we don't have any further questions. So I'm gonna okay. thank you once again, Jen Ling, for that uh, very interesting talk and thank all the speakers from this session. So that ends this session. Um, just a reminder, these were all proceedings tracks talks. So they will be appearing as publications in bioinformatics and it's expected that that um, special issue will be out sometime in October. So thank you all for attending this session and I hope you enjoy the rest of the conference.